Hi, it's Mark Owen from Moose Marketing and PR, the editor of Punchline Magazine, and welcome to Punchline Talks, the business breakfast briefers, where each week I invite a panel of experts to review the morning newspapers, find out what's going on in their own individual business sectors, their own individual businesses, and finally, what's caught their eye in this week's Punchline. I've got a fantastic panel of guests, so let me introduce you to David Morton, headmaster of King School, Neil Ruckett, CEO of Viserian, and Kurt Wyman, Managing Director of Kurt Wyman Surveyors and Property Experts, and hopefully Talitha Nelson will be joining us very, very shortly. Anyway, welcome guys, welcome to Punchline Talks. Let me just quickly rattle through the newspaper headlines. Here we go, the Western Daily Press, Council sorry for adoption failings. The Citizen Newspaper, chaos, mum's anger over school parking. The Times, Variant halts travel to Africa. The Daily Telegraph, my wife was on the boat, tracked on GPS, then it disappeared. Very, very sad story about this. But, uh, these migrants uh, unfortunately lost their lives. Six counties on the red list as COVID variant poses significant threats, says The Guardian. The Daily Express, UK troops patrol French beaches. And then the Daily Mail, the exact opposite. Macron's non to UK boots on French be beaches. So if someone's got that wrong somewhere, the Daily Mirror, the DIY death boats, terrible, absolutely terrible. The Sun, Richard out, Arlene and Naughty Boy on the brink. I've got no idea what they're talking about there. I think that celebrity get me out of here. And the Daily Star, the Daily Star, don't you just love it? Could somebody call the fire brigade for the old girl, please? This is about Madonna getting stuck under the bed. And um, the, the, the main song is Papa, Mama Can't Reach, is one of the templates in there, which I absolutely love. Anyway, we'll crack on with the show as Talif is just about to join us. David, what have you picked out for us, please? Well, just to pick up on your, your headlines there, I think the, the new variant uh, that has been uh, discovered uh, and the possible uh, increase of uh, lockdowns again um, is obviously something which is a concern for a lot of people, I think, this morning. Uh, parents I've been speaking to have said that they kind of feel we just need to get on with life now and uh, accept that COVID is going to be with us. Uh, but every time a new variant comes, you know, that, that changes the landscape a little bit. So um, I'm you know, really optimistic. Obviously, as a head teacher, I want children to be in school all over the county and all over the country. Um, but we obviously have to keep them safe. Uh, that's our, our kind of first duty, really, as, as head teachers. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to watch that story in, in the weeks ahead. That's right. It's a very, very scary development that is coming down the tracks, isn't it? What else have you picked out from the papers, please, David? Well, so I uh, went with Black Friday. Um, I was looking at an article online and uh, rather than sort of the traditional uh, excitement over all the offers that are out there in the shops and so on, it was really nice that it was a, an article about Stop Black Friday uh, organised by uh, someone who set up a company called Different Kind. Uh, this was in the I newspaper and it was uh, a feature on socially conscious retailers uh, and looking at how uh, we can support small producers uh, locally, minority groups, people with disabilities, uh, reinvest the profit. So the exact opposite of the, the Black Friday rushing to the big stores and buying things you don't really need that have travelled most of the way around the world to get there. Um, so, you know, this is something that we see, again, in education, children are much more conscious of their choices and their parents' choices and, and where things come from and the impact of their uh, lifestyle choices as well. So I think that's really interesting. And uh, as a cathedral school, I perhaps point out that it's Advent this weekend, and that's the traditional start of the Christmas period. Uh, it's a shame that the headlines are all dominated by Black Friday and consumerism. Could totally agree, totally agree. To really, really good story to start off with. Thanks ever so much for that, David. I'll go over to uh, Kurt now. Kurt, what have you picked out for us, please? Um, a, a little bit of a, a positive one, Mark. We, you know, we had the uh, COP26 summit uh, only a few weeks ago, and it seems to have gone off the agenda uh, quite quickly. I know there's been a, a lot of other things that have it's taken its place. Um, but there were a few articles this week in the paper, sort of follow-ons. And one of those, and I think it's sort of a lot of work to be done, but very much on a positive note. Uh, and there was an article, both in the Times and the Telegraph, um, curbs on plastic waste seem to be working. Um, Single-use plastics, plastic bottles, cotton buds, plastic bags, and so on and so forth. And I think there was a research done recently that... Um, the, over the last 12 months, the litter found on British beaches is 10% lower than it was previously, uh, which I think is an all-time low in the last 20 years. So I think 
with all these things, there is an awful lot more to be done, but it just shows something simple. We, we don't need single use plastics. There is absolutely no need for them apart from burying them in the ground and using them, you know, it's just crazy. There's got to be other solutions out there, that, you know, at the moment. Um, but it's positive to see a good story coming through that actually, you know, a small thing, but it can start to work quite quickly, which is what people want to see. Great story. Totally agree with you that it was like 10 or 15 percent, wasn't it? Reduction on our beaches. Um, what else have you picked out for us very quickly? Um, a couple of things. Um, an interesting one, really. Um, and mine is sort of I've tried to sort of stick with environment and sort of property, which are my, are my things. Um, the one, interestingly, and it's not local, but I think there's a local bearing to it. Um, and when I first saw the article, it was in a few times this week in various papers. And when I first saw the article, I thought it was actually a building in Gloucester because it looked very, very similar to a property that we've been involved with. But it was actually, it's um, Marks and Spencers are in trouble about their flagship, flagship store, uh, Marble Arch in London. And they've got a lovely old Art Deco building uh, that stood there for nearly a hundred years. And uh, the plan is they've just been given planning permission to demolish it and build something new in its place. And I think that the feeling is, although I haven't seen the plans, that the replacement that they're putting up uh, is very bland, nothing exciting, and what a waste knocking down this building. But it looked absolutely identical to the old Argos building in, in Gloucester, which is an also, uh, you know, a beautiful old Art Deco building, seen better times. Um, and I think, again, you know, following on from the sort of theme of the, of the first one, uh, it, you know, it said in the report that knocking the building down and replacing it with a new building would be responsible for 39 and a half thousand tonnes of carbon, um, which, you know, by, by Marks and Spencer's own assessment would require 2.4 million trees to offset that car, you know, the, 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 the buildup of carbon. So, you know, it's one of those, I think we need to find new ways because that seems uh, crazy, but. Well, that's, that is the perfect link to our next guest who's Neil Ricketts, Neil Ricketts from Viserian. Viserian manufactures graphene. Graphene, they're just putting into concrete. Neil, welcome to Punchline Talks. It's got me mask on here, Mark, because I heard you come back from South Africa on your holiday, so I just. Well, I, I think you should keep it on, it suits you, mate. <laughs> Totally reusable, featuring graphene. <laughs> Perfect product, just saying. Uh, I saw so, your adverts uh, in the Times, by the way. I did I see mean, the adverts. The, the papers are dominated by a few stories. Immigration was one of the ones that I was going to lead with. I mean, uh, it's a very polarizing story. You can't uh, say the right thing uh, without upsetting somebody, but it is a major challenge. You know, the, these poor people, you know, they're. They've had their homes destroyed. You know, what, what would you do if you were in their position? And, um, you know, so that's a, a big story that's being led. The government are obviously really struggling. Climate change, as Kurt said, you know, huge. I've just come back from Barcelona where we had a, a, an exhibition and a, and, and, and a conference about, you know, how do we change the world? There's a lot of talk. How much action is there? You know, I'd really like to see some of these things starting to come to fruition now. We haven't got time. Interesting enough, uh, following what Kurt said about the plastic pollution, I'm absolutely sure that that's a result of people not going to the beaches because of the lockdowns. And it's the first time we've seen an improvement in the, the Great Barrier Reef. So uh, huge uh, improvement in the color and, uh, and the life of the Barrier Reef. And is that because we weren't flying and, uh, and doing the things? There's a a kind of move towards going back to where we were pre-pandemic but I think we do really need to question this I mean a few years ago we would have been doing this in your office we'd have all been traveling to the fire station which is now redundant and um and, and having you know having traveled in the traffic having got stressed but actually do you know what I quite like the fact that you, know, you rang me up five minutes before the show and uh, and I was able to get there for you Mark so that's brilliant mate can you just move your mic slightly it's it's rubbing and making a kind of beacon noise Oh, I'm terribly sorry about that, Mark. Yeah, that's okay. No, no, no. I, I will no. move that for you. I, I love the way you get my fire station in there. Okay, la last last thirty seconds, then, mate, and then we'll go over to to, to leave for please. Uh, the the other thing I was going to mention is inflation. You know, so we do need to keep a cautious uh, look on inflation. It's in the papers today about the price of bread going up. Uh, I'll be making my own bread from now on. But um, there there yeah you know, there is a move towards you know higher inflation as we go through the next few months. So um, we just need to be uh, a little bit cautious. 
Fantastic. Thanks ever so much for a great roundup. I totally agree about the beaches, maybe. You're right. Nobody's been there, have they? So it kind of makes sense. Tanitha, welcome to Punchline Talks. Great to see you. Um, what have you picked out from the papers, please? I mean, I don't get the papers. I live in the middle of nowhere. But in terms of news and sort of sticking to charity, probably in my sector, um, I think for us, it's always slightly worrying as 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 it is for businesses. The stocks um, and, and prices are starting to be affected by the new COVID uh, variant and everybody's getting slightly worried. And we have an investment. So anything that affects our investment means there's less money for the charity sector. So that's always a concern when we see stocks and shares. Um, it went down probably in the middle of the pandemic at the start by about 20% our investment. So that was really, really worrying. And then actually it came back up and we'd lost around 2%. So um, we've managed to ride the wave of the pandemic, but obviously <laughs> you just don't feel you know what's in front of you. Um, I think the worry for us is now we're hitting a really hard winter. Um, the charity sector is filling the huge gaps that statutory provision cannot fill um, and our charities are under so much pressure at the moment so I'm always concerned about income. Revenue streams as you know are always affected through the lack of face-to-face -face fundraising um, and so stocks and shares if you've got an investment like us we, we have an endowment and that endowment is a, a community asset for life for the community um, and we rely on that endowment to keep giving grants to the county so that's I guess a concern for us um, as always. And um, but on local news, and I'm sad I missed it and I wanted to get there, but Gloss Cathedral, they obviously run a ch charity side of their organisation and we support them, um, were auctioning off some very special items, <laughs> which I seem to have missed out on, um, which is quite a rare thing. Um, they had an auction. I don't know if any of you managed to hear about it or see it or get there, um, but you could have uh, acquired some amazing pieces of history. Um, they've got their stonemasons out the back and they were auctioning off some incredible stones, some very historic stones and various other things. So I don't know if anyone saw that, but I feel like I've missed out on something now. OK, no, thanks ever so much, Talifa, for that. I'm going to go back over to Neil. I'm sorry I'm not going to keep in order because I know, Neil, you've got to dash off. So uh, just a quick roundup of Vasarian. Congratulations with your deal that you've done with Superdry. Can you just tell us a little bit more about that, please? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is really exciting. Obviously, uh, next week we've got the opening of the new Cheltenham store, and uh, and that's going to be uh, exciting. Superdrive moving into an awful lot of new ranges, including you know sportswear, etc. But the big thing for me is to be involved in a company that's really challenging the sustainability. You know, textiles is a terrible user of materials. A lot of garments, you know, they never get worn. They go straight from shop to to landfill. We've got to, we, we can't carry on doing that. We've got to have garments which are fit for purpose. They last a long time. You know, fashion is great, don't get me wrong, but by its very nature, fashion is very changeable. We won't have that luxury in the future, I don't think. You know, we will have to provide, you know, a bit like your waistcoat there, Mark, you know, that's had a few outings, you know, and, and that's <laughs> going to be the mantra for the future, you know. Um, <laughs> But, you know, if we can introduce technology that makes these garments much, you know, much more, much better value, then that's really going to be the way forward. And um, it, it's a bit like in, in our field, the, the really exciting things is where we can take something and make it far more useful than what we take. So if you imagine like a pane of glass, well, it, its only function is to look through. Whereas if you add technology, it can be an antenna, it can be a heater, it can be a display, it can be all sorts of different things. And then it becomes you know, much more useful and much more uh, likely to be continued to be used. We're, and we're doing that with textiles as well. So uh, hopefully we'll be working with Superdry to, to come up with sustainable clothing that uh, not only reduces the overall impact, but, um, but makes it uh, a much better proposition for the future as well. No, it was, and it was great that we could uh, break that story as well. So thanks ever so much for that, Neil. Um, I just wanted to come in there. I'm really impressed because they launched their Oxford Street store with a big secondhand, well, vintage Nike section and selling, you know, it's really amazing what they're doing and very innovative um, and, you know, selling secondhand clothes. Who would have thought? I've come from a big retail background, developing brands um, and fashion, hadn't really thought about the impact 20 years ago. And like you say now, um, it's a really uncomfortable place to be unless you're thinking sustainably. Um, I, think, uh, and 
a plain white T-shirt takes 3,000 litres of water to make. Yeah, exactly. 3,000 um, litres of water to make 3, a white... 3,000 litres of water just to make a plain white T-shirt. But how come yeah. they sell them in Primark then for like £2.99? Exactly. because it's so bad <laughs> right, okay well that, that goes go. i mean it's affecting those areas in the world where the whole lakes are disappearing where where production is happening they're losing their rivers and lakes and everything's drying up it, it's having a huge impact but i'm yeah i'm really really impressed we have people so innovative in our county leading leading the way it's brilliant i'm gonna have to go mark the only thing i wanted to uh, to finish on was the fact that uh, good news story the queen's feeling better and uh, she's told the family that uh, she's going to be okay for christmas you know i am starting to get a bit worried about the queen I, I, I love the queen i love what the royal family do they've they've always helped business as far as i'm concerned and uh, you know i think that's a, a that that is you know christmas christmas is all about families it's it's not about black friday as david said it's it's about being together and, uh, and and celebrating being together. And after the last two years, you know, it, it's uh, it'll be even more poignant, I think. But uh, I'm going to have to leave you now, unfortunately. But last thing, what's the story for Punchline that you picked out? Well, it, it was going to be the uh, the story about Superdry opening their new Cheltenham store on uh, on Tuesday and featuring their new their new ranges. But actually, I'm I'm going to go with. Um, uh, with the Stroud MP, you know, presenting oh, the online uh, abuse. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, but, uh, more than happy to carry on the, the conversation <laughs> after I leave. But um, we, we can't tolerate this in society, yeah. I'm afraid. And um, the more people that stand up to this bullying and anonymous kind of uh, things, there's, a, there's a, very much a difference between banter and, and downright <laughs> disgraceful behaviour. And uh, mm. I think uh, we've got to make a stand. I know Forest Dean District Council, Tim Gwilym, and now we're starting to get the MPs. I, I think it's a really powerful thing. We don't want a society where these people exist, unfortunately. No, I totally agree. And thanks ever so much for joining us, mate, so late in the no day. Problem, well, I pre appreciate it. Always great to see you. And I'll see you Tuesday night. Yeah, see you later. Thanks very okay. much, everyone. David, let's move on to you, sir. Obviously, King, headmaster of King's School. Now, the independent sector, when, when COVID struck and all the business people started to obviously get very worried, um, it looked like the independent school sector was going to be absolutely decimated. But that's not the case, isn't it? As the economy has recovered, the independent sector has done extremely well. I think the independent sector has has done well. Um, I think one of the advantages of being independent is that you can adapt very swiftly uh, and you're not necessarily dependent on central government or local government to uh, give you guidance or permission to do things. So uh, we were able as a, an independent school with some very supportive governors to adapt uh, when the situation arose and uh, to adjust our education. So uh, schools were closed uh, way back in March, weren't they? And uh, so uh, two years ago now, uh, and by the start of the following term, we'd got all the remote learning set up as many other uh, local schools had done and we hit the ground running from day one. So uh, I think that started uh, something of a divide, which in some ways saddens me, but of course I'm also proud of my own, proud of my own institution. Um, but I think the independent schools did do well. They adapted quickly and, and people began to see uh, that that difference. And of course, you know, people invest in their children's education because it's one of the most important things you can give uh, to your family. Um, so we have seen uh, numbers uh, rising at King's in the last couple of years. Uh, and we've also seen the move west uh, from uh, the southeast of England as a result of uh, the pandemic and the, the changing patterns in the UK. Um, but I know some other schools have found things difficult and some independent schools have boarding. Uh, they depend on overseas borders uh, and certainly that aspect of their marketing has been much, much harder. So I think, you know, overall it's been positive, uh, but there are certainly some schools who, uh, who have found things difficult. Now, King School um, and Wright, they, they were hopefully you saw that we recognised you guys as well for the fantastic work that you did during the pandemic. You were making visors and uh, you had a little factory going there at one point, wasn't it? Yeah, we did. We uh, were using our own uh, facilities uh, to, to make some of the PPE for uh, the NHS. We also made, uh, we got into a sort of sideline of making screens for reception areas. So uh, the monk's kitchen in Gloucester Cathedral uh, had some, their visitors area had some. Uh, we made them for a couple of other parents who worked in local charities, at hospices and so on. Uh, so we, we, again, adapted fairly swiftly and, and did what, you know, every business should do really, which is support your local community when, when times get hard. Now, you've also invested in the school as well. You've got £2 million you've spent on a new sixth form. Can you just quickly tell us about that? 
Yeah, of course, be delighted to. Uh, and this is another one with a community link as well. So uh, the school and the cathedral are very closely linked. Our, our buildings are literally intertwined in the centre of Gloucester. Um, and our sick form centre was a very old building dating back to the 13th century. Over the years, it had grown quite tired. And I think you came and interviewed me in it just before we started the work. Um, and we've now invested, as you say, a couple of million pounds uh, into that uh, cathedral owned building and we've turned it into a 21st century workspace so um, the students are going to be prepared for the world of work it's much more flexible the furniture is all modular the wi-fi is fantastic the interactive whiteboards are state of the art there's a kind of cafe social space where they can both relax and work at the same time um, and we've uh, put artwork around the walls which reflect uh, sort of themes of inclusivity and celebrating diversity and inspirational figures from uh, British and, and global history so uh, we're really really excited by it. and uh, in terms of kind of measurable outputs as a as a business um, to turn away from being a school for a moment uh, we've seen a threefold interest in uh, the sick form uh, from external pupils which has been wonderful as well i mean no i'll have to go back and have a look at it obviously because we've got the video of what it used to look like and also i just want to say that so one of the one of the things i did really enjoy about king school was that i met my uh, hero terry Waite as well and uh, that was fantastic to meet him anyway thanks ever so much for that david we go back over to you kurt um didn't you used to go to King's School, Kurt? I did, yeah. David wasn't the headmaster then, but <laughs> <laughs> this was 30 years ago. <laughs> anyway, the commercial the commercial property market uh, that you're an expert in, we see your boards all over the place. In fact, it seems like, you know, you kind of dominate the market in some ways. Um, um, we all know that the warehousing side of the business has boomed, but what about the offices? Mm. Um, <laughs> the office market's a difficult one, Mark, to be honest, because when you look at uh, Gloucestershire, or when you look at Cheltenham and Gloucester, uh, you've got two very different markets there. The Cheltenham market over recent years has actually been very, very strong. There's a lot of companies that were very keen to move into the centre of Cheltenham, which is great to see that resurgence again after companies for many years sort of moving to uh, business parks on the outskirts. So it's great to see that companies realise the benefits of coming back into a, into a town. And certainly in Cheltenham, we've seen record levels of rental. And that's still there. There's a few schemes in Cheltenham uh, where, where, you know, they're getting great interest on the offices. Um, the Quadrangle recently refurbished to, you know, to provide really modern plan, open plan offices right in the centre of town. And if you do that, record levels of rental. So that market is still there, I think. Uh, the Gloucester market has been a lot more patchy um, and it traditionally has been. Um, it's not easy, but it hasn't been easy for a number of years. Having said that, deals are still being done. And we you know, don't think by any means that the office market is dead and there's nothing happening because that's not the case. I was speaking to an agent yesterday uh, who's marketing a scheme on the outskirts of Gloucester um, and there's demand for the scheme. You know, they haven't got one vacant unit and there's strong demand there. Now, that's not the case throughout the town. It's a little bit more patchy. But where we've scored on a few occasions, a company's downsizing. So they're in 8,000 square feet of offices, had a reorganisation because of COVID, people working from home and so on and so forth. Um, and accordingly, they've downsized. They now want 4,000 square feet. So I think the market is still there. Um, I wouldn't be calling it just yet that people aren't going to be working from offices. I think that's a bit of a knee-jerk reaction. And uh, I think the sense is that offices are definitely here to stay. Uh, but I think there will be a little bit more flexibility with some companies. OK, what a very, very quickly, mate, the overall look on the retail sector and the hospitality sector. Are they bouncing back or, you know, like some Montpellier, which has seemed to have struggled, are landlords at long last reducing their, their rents? The, the big issue, mate, Mark, isn't so much the, the rentals, actually. Um, and we, what we haven't seen dramatically is rentals drop, ironically, because a lot of rentals are historic. You know, these companies have been there uh, for many years and often the rentals can only go up, and not down. Um, so it's a bit of a false market in many respects. Um, the, the big thing that hits the, the retailers because of those historic high rents is the rating liability. So the business rates for a lot of these companies is the issue, because even if landlords take a fairly pragmatic view and say, well, actually, the rentals were up there, they're now there. So let's do a deal at that. Um, it's still the business rate that is a big issue for a lot of the retail occupiers. Um, having said that, um, the, there has been a slight resurgence in the retail market, which is great to see. It's not all doom and gloom. 
Uh, some of that is led by the charity sector. Um, you know, there's a lot of charity shops out there now. It's big business. It's not the charity shops that we envisaged 15, 20 years ago. Um, you know, this is a big business. And uh, we manage in a state where there's uh, an industrial unit run by a charity that now run 20 odd shops throughout the county. It, it is a business. And we've also seen a resurgence of small independence coming back to what was being said earlier, which is absolutely fantastic. It really is. And I think the big stores are moving out. Uh, smaller independents coming through. Okay, thanks ever so much, Kurt. Fantastic snapshot of what's going on in the market. T Talitha, let's know, uh, you're the CEO of Gloucester Community Foundation, looking after the charity sector. You and I talked a lot during the pandemic. We were really worried that a lot of the, a lot of the charities were on their knees. Uh, what's the sort of um, case at the moment? How's it all going? Yeah, it's tough. So uh, we did um, a major piece of research in the pandemic, looking at how we could support um, the resilience building of our sector. So we, we, we're trying to get through a pandemic and what does it look like? And most charity leaders were trying, ripped up their strategies and business plans and had to start all over again. So I think for us, the major piece of research at the time when we did it in 2020, 20, early 21 this year, um, was charities under 50,000 turnover were vulnerable, but there wasn't many of those. And the majority looked pretty resilient. And that was brilliant to look at Gloucestershire and our charity sector. We've got about 5,000 charities, 3,000 registered. It's an incredible sector in our county. Um, has been very much uh, in, the, in the sort of shadows of every other sector and probably very unrecognized and appreciated. And I think through the pandemic, the charity third sector really had the light shone. It was all about community, all about charity. And finally, there was some press and some, you know, acknowledgement for this incredible sector. And actually it's continued. So I think over the 12 months, most of those charities had some fairly good reserves, had some stability. Now, we don't know what the future looks like, but I think once those reserves may be depleted and once we get through the 12 months where money was flowing through quite well through COVID, there was quite a bit of money coming through various areas from government and grants and trusts, that money is disappearing. And I think when you look at a normal year or regular year 2022, where you don't have that funding and where the need is going to dramatically go up, I think we're going to start seeing um, change this year. This is the year that we're feeling pretty concerned about. Um, so we hope um, that we can continue funding and that takes the sectors to come together. Hopefully corporate social responsibility is on the up and anyone who's doing very well in the county really thinks about giving back to their community. And there's so many ways to do that, not just money, but time. Um, we do a big piece of work with some of the, the um, corporates around pro bono work and support. So I think when you're looking at next next year, I think it's about the sectors working together and we're gonna have to work together like never before because all of us are affected in community, whatever sector we're in. Um, so that's the piece of work I'm doing at the moment, how we can work better together as a sector. But I have got some breaking news and I would like to let you all know, Jeremy Clarkson launched his new beer last night. My friends at Cotswold Brewing Company um, have just launched a brand new beer in Gloucestershire, which is very exciting. And I'm sure it will go global. It's called Hawkstone. Um, and uh, they're brewing down at College Farm on the Stow Road near Broughton on the Water. And they had a brilliant night last night um, with, the, with, with launching it. So I'm so excited to see the innovation of small businesses in this county that seem to just grow and grow and do amazing stuff. And I think having someone like Jeremy fighting the corner of rural communities, farming, I mean, most of our friends are farmers and they said he's done more for farming than most organisations. So to have a new beer in the county, I'm very excited about. It's called Hawkstone. He's got his website launched and it's really exciting to see, um, you know, great businesses doing great work. Thanks so much. Fantastic for that little bit of a scoop as well. That's what we like about this show. David, <laughs> OK, we're moving on now to uh, the punchline section, actually. What, what's caught your eye on this week's punchline? We don't have very much time left, unfortunately, but uh, we can quickly rattle through. What's what's caught your eye, sir? Yeah, just uh, one little article, which is it was lovely to see, was uh, you had a, a piece about uh, a former King's student, Adam Heron, who's going to be performing 
uh, in a music concert in uh, Cheltenham and had dropped out and had found a replacement. Um, and it was it was really lovely to see uh, exactly as we just heard from Talitha that there's still that that great community support and people want to get out and we've got to support music uh, and you know the local industries that we've talked about. So I was really pleased to see that the show will always go on uh, in in the best fashion. So that was good to see. Thanks ever so much. Okay, I love the bit. The show must go on, and this one must go on as well. Kurt, what's caught your eye, please, sir? Uh, I think this week, Mark Gloucester, the uh, the Gloucester Food Dock. Uh, mm. Down off Commercial Road. Um, this has been, I, I went round that building many, many years ago. I think when it was on the market about six or seven years ago. And, um, you know, it's sat there. We've driven past it hundreds of times. And it looks like, I think they got planning back in 2016. Um, they, they've now changed the plans back in 2019. They're on site. The, you know, the builders are there. It's all happening. And I think importantly, that will act as a little bit of a catalyst between the town and Gloucester Keys, which has been sadly lacking, not through any fault of anybody, because I know that uh, the council have very much tried to get that throughput of people and make the route a little bit easier. Um, but it's still been a, a little bit out of the way, but I think this will act as a good link between the town and the Keys and the docks. Thanks very much for that one. Talitha, what's caught your eye, please? I know we don't have much time, so it was for me um, about our Stroud MP bringing, um, I think she was amazing in Parliament and the way she spoke. She She's just brilliant, um, highlighting this horrific online abuse. Um, and it just doesn't seem to um, get dealt with at the top of these billion dollar companies who very quickly, when there was a COVID announcement online, they could put COVID restrictions on and they did things very quickly when they needed to. Um, for some reason, when there's bullying language, nothing pops up. Um, and you know they're making huge amounts of money out of social media and they're not doing anything and government must crack down you know this has got to stop it's absolutely horrific the suicide rates of our children are going up dramatically and the correlation between that and the and social media is huge um, I won't go into the stats but it's horrific so not just for children and adults but the whole of the globe is going through this social media crisis that just has to be dealt with if 20 years down the line we're going to look back and think what was going on and how horrific it was and how it just wasn't being dealt with no thanks so much and that was my pick of the week as well actually i i interviewed mm. um um sean bailey i think she's got a fight in her hands it's going to be really really tough because they're going to have people actually who won't like this at all they they want to abuse other people and um and yeah it's going to be a, a, a tough fight but i think we can all get behind her i think that'd be great anyway thanks ever so much for joining a punchline talk today so if you like the show please like share and subscribe and hopefully we'll see you again next week thanks for joining us bye thank you